I'm Matilda McQuaid, I'm Deputy Curatorial Director, and also one of the um, four curators for the National Design Triennial Why Design Now, which is an exhibition at the Cooper Hewitt. And in case you don't know where the Cooper Hewitt is, this, it's at 2 East 91st Street, um, way up there. And this is the front of the museum, which is all about now, um, why design now, and which has the overarching theme of environmental and social responsibility all over the world. Um, before I introduce the panel, before we begin our conversation, I took it upon myself, um, because since I chose Medellin for the triennial, I wanted to set the stage for what the discussion is going to be about, because this is going to be a discussion. We have asked the panelists not to give presentations, but um, Mark, who will be the moderator, Mark Robbins, and I'll introduce them after my um, mini intro. Um, we'll lead the three panelists in a discussion, and then we will have, I hope, a good chunk of time for question and answers afterwards. But I just wanted to give you a little background on Medellin, which is an extraordinarily beautiful city in the Andean Mountains, with a population of about three million people. And due to its incredible um, temperate climate, it is, has one of the biggest exports of flowers. And I had the, um, the good fortune of being down in Medellin um, during its famed um, flower festival. And you'll see some examples of that in just a bit. Um, but it's, these flowers are grown along the hillsides and you probably have all kind of bought a bouquet of these because they're, um, as I said, one of the biggest exports. But Medellin didn't always have such a um, beautiful and happy demeanor. Um, as you can see from the statistics, um, it was a very different city in the 1980s and 1990s um, from the present, when um, violence was really, as you can see, extraordinarily high. And it was known as one of the most violent cities in the world due to drug cartels. And the most notorious being, as you probably know, Pablo Escobar, whose death in 1993 was really the beginning of Medellin's, I'd like to think, um, its renaissance. And as you can see from this graph, um, just in the last 10 years, the murder rate halved, and by 2007, it almost reached 70%. Pretty remarkable. So why? Well, there was a new mayor elected in 2004, and as you can see, I mean, there were certainly beginnings of this even before um, Sergio Fajardo, who was the mayor at this time, um, was elected. But um, this 2004 was the beginning of the kind of intense period. And as mayor through 2007, um, this was the period of the most intense strategic planning um, of rebuilding Medellin. And this was when the plan was formulated and some of the most important and major architecture projects were commissioned. So as you can see, this is just kind of a very succinct list of what happened and just Think about it in five years. Fajardo's administration decided to take a two-pronged approach to reduce, um, to reduce the crime. At the same time, police were overcoming the guerrilla and paramilitary organizations throughout the city. Their actions were followed immediately by social interventions that made the community feel invested in the outcome. The concept of co-responsibility was basic to achieving development. The strategy was brilliant and straightforward and consisted of four main points. The first one was to plan, was planning to prevent improvisation. And this meant high standard design, communicating and involving the community during the entire project, and making public spaces and public buildings the driving force of the urban transformation. The second was selecting, and this has to do with this quotation you see on the, sh the screen, selecting the most dangerous and poorest areas for these architectural projects. Um, this would hopefully reinstill pride, confidence, and ownership in the um, local communities. The third was choosing cultural and education projects, 
like library parks, high quality schools and museums to dignify the neighborhoods. These large scale public buildings would strengthen urban centers when there was a deficit of these services. And number four, and the final one, was the teams for these projects included not only architects and designers, but social workers, technical and social experts, urban planners, and many more. They all had input along with the communities in the final outcome. And of course their mantra became, as Sergio Fajardo says, our most beautiful buildings must be in our poorest areas. And this is what it begins to look like on a map, where you can see the concentration of projects to the north, which is basically the poorest parts of Medellin. And this is what it looks like now. Um, this slide of Parque de, de los Niños perhaps best answers the question of why this transformation in Medellin. And the answer is simple for Medellin's children. That they can feel hopeful about the future and their possibilities for the future. And here's another park, Mirador, a small pocket park, which is situated near the infamous uh, Metro Cable, which you'll see more pictures of later, and which connects the community of Santo Domingo to the Metro at the foot of the hills. But the knuckle of the new Medellin is this area where several major architecture and infrastructure projects come together. Park Explora, which you see those four red blocks down at the bottom of the screen, and Orchidorama, which is directly above it and has the kind of green organic configurations. And in between is this main avenue that runs north and south, and you can see that sort of colored area of the, um, the street. And this links the wealthy area in the south to the poor neighborhoods to the north. The Orquita Rama, which was designed by Camilo Restrepo, is, who is, will be on the panel in a minute, um, in association with Plan B architect and J. Paul Restrepo, is an extraordinary nave of wooden tree-like forms to exhibit prize orchids from the botanical garden. The architecture of Orquita Rama mimics the way that a garden grows flowers, starting to sprout next to one another until, until a somewhat modular group of plants appears. It is also at its most basic a beautiful public gathering space, as well as a location for special events. Park Explora by architect Alejandro Echeverri is a science and discovery museum with important hands-on exhibits. Um, and it's, what's interesting about this is its direct relationship to this north-south axis, which you see, this is when it's still under construction. It becomes an important um, communal space because people who are walking along the street can look down and see this amazing array of hands-on outdoor exhibits. So it becomes a gathering place not only for people who just happen upon it, but also for those school groups as well as um, people who, it, who it's a destination for. And here are just some interior shots of it. Now I just want to give you a glimpse of some of the additional public projects in other communities like Santo Domingo, which I showed you just briefly before, and which is now connected to above ground um, by a cable car system to the metro um, above ground system um, in the foothills below. It's a, it's a, it's a hillside town, so it, it's um, precarious to get down to the metro cable. So this gives you a sense of where it is. And this is the metro cable. Um, before this cable car system was installed, locals were basically unable to reach the metro system that would bring them downtown due to the unsafe streets from gunfights between neighborhood drug and militias. The cable car now carries about 30,000 people per day. And as you can see, one of the most prominent buildings on this hillside is one of the, um, the libraries, um, the Park Biblioteca España. For me, and I'm just showing you different views of it, um, 
For me, I think one of the most significant aspects of this library is that its primary function is not a library. Approximately 40% of it is devoted to books, and the rest contains a variety of public services, um, such as job training centers, daycare centers, daycare centers, kindergartens, microcredit networks that promote local business and also lend money. There's an auditorium as well as dozens of computer stations that kids sign up for. The day that I visited this library, all of the stations were completely full with kids um, from six ages on up. Here you can see some of the interior of it. This is another um, uh, library in the area of Berlin, um, which actually was a gift from the Japanese um, government to the city of Medellin. Um, just a beautiful kind of quiet building in the center part. You can just make out kind of this beautiful pool um, that really offers, um, as someone said, both mental and physical tranquility. Another, um, another library. Um, and I think what's interesting is these, again, are sort of sited in the poorest neighborhoods, but as you can see, they have the most incredible view. Um, but probably it was a view that was never, ever seen before in the drug, drug war years. But beside the library and parks, there's the transformation of the street, which became really integral to the city. Expanded sidewalks, landscaping, brick pavers, urban furniture, as well as a safe environment, all contributed to people returning to the streets as an extension of their home. In Santo Domingo alone, where there in 2002, 2003, there were only 18 commercial spaces along the main street. Now there's more than 270. Bridges became symbolic and physical connections between neighborhoods that were once separated because of um, drug militias. So here's a couple of um, images of these incredible bridges that span, again, were totally isolated. Um, I talked with people that had never ventured to the neighboring um, villages because of, um, because of the war. Education was also a key component of Medellin's transformation. A dozen new schools have been built with an additional 120 to 130 schools renovated and uh, modernized to include state-of-the-art classrooms and facilities. Fajardo and his administration believed that to achieve social equality through education was paramount, and as a result, many of these schools far surpass private schools in terms of physical conditions. This has in turn resulted in a dramatic improvement in the low-performing schools. By investing in the building and renovating these schools, young people see a future that is not focused on violence. And here is just some other um, schools that were built during that time. And this is a quote from Fajardo that I think sort of summarizes um, Medellin for me. People who say that a beautiful building doesn't improve education do not understand something critical. We have to build Medellin's most beautiful buildings in the places where they have never been a real state. The first step towards quality education is the dignity of the space. When the poorest kid in Medellin arrives in the best classroom in the city, there is a powerful message of social inclusion. That kid has a newfound self-esteem, and he learns math more easily. If you give the most humble neighborhoods beautiful libraries, you make those communities proud of the libraries. That is powerful. We are saying that a library or school with its spectacular architecture is the most important building in the neighborhood. And it is sending the rest of society a very clear message of social transformation, but a social transformation without rage. This is our revolution. The most powerful people see us focusing on the most humble, and they are supporting us. That is an important achievement. And I'm going to close with this um, wonderful image from the Flower Festival that I mentioned to you earlier. Um, an event that 
truly attracts over a million people from all over Colombia and South America in a one week period. And that basically is just a celebration of the flower growers in the surrounding hills. And they have these incredible competitions. And this one, I think, um, sums it up. And there were several of these kinds of displays that had a similar message. And in Spanish, um, it trans or in English, it translates to, we educate our children in order to build the country that we dream about. So this is a little background on Medellin. And um, it really gives me enormous pleasure to introduce our four esteemed panelists who have been intimately involved in different capacities in this incredible transformation. Um, Mr. Maurizio Valencia is the current planning director of Medellin. And between 2002 and 2005, he served as coordinating architect, technical and general manager for the development and construction of the International Convention Center of Medellin and Plaza Mayor. And since 2005, he has worked in the public sector, initially as Secretary of Public Works until 2009, when he was named Planning Director by the current mayor, Al um, Alonzo Salazar. He is trained as an architect and planner. Our second panelist is Mr. Federico Restrepo, formerly the Planning Director under Fajardo's administration. And he is currently the CEO of Empresas Publicas de Medellin, EPM for short a public utility company that belongs to the municipality and is the second largest public services company in Colombia and one of the most efficient companies in Latin America. EPM provides the major support for the urban projects that you have just seen and we look forward to hearing more about some of these works. And I just want to reiterate that public services means telecommunications, it means all gas, energy, everything and which we're in the United States very unfamiliar with, but it's all under one umbrella. Camilo Restrepo was an architect who graduated from Universidad Pontificia, sorry, um, in Medellin in 1998. Um, and just as a side note, Medellin I think is home to at least four schools of architecture, if not more. Um, and Camilo currently teaches in Medellin at a school of architecture, and among other projects, he has designed the Orchidurama, um, which I showed you earlier. And leading our discussion this afternoon is Mark Robbins, who is dean of the School of Architecture at Syracuse University. And before coming to Syracuse, um, Craig was the, um, sorry, Mark, <laughs> my husband. <laughs> Was, um, God, that was, weird. Um, was director of design at the National Endowment of Arts, where he developed an aggressive program to strengthen the presence of innovative design in the public realm. He has led a studio um, to Medellin a couple of years ago and has had constant contact with all the important people in Medellin um, and has studied certainly its, city's design, its city design and development. So Mark is going to lead the discussion um, for about 45 minutes, and then we will follow with um, questions from the audience. So, and then there's refreshments afterwards. Mm -hmm. So we're just gonna do a little kind of um, reshuffle of the stage, and so the panelists can come up. Thank you. Um, images of uh, Medellin. Uh, I was counseled by uh, one of my professors, uh, Francisco Sinin, uh, not to say Medi Medellin, but Medellin. So um, hopefully I'm doing it correctly. Uh, and uh, it, it's, a, it's a good opportunity to revisit the ways in which uh, architecture makes sense in a, in a critical way. Can you hear me without this, or do you need yeah. this? I think we need it. You need it. Oh, uh, unfortunately. Okay. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I. I probably don't need to convince many people in this room that uh, architecture is significant, that design makes a difference, that it actually has an impact on, on culture and uh, not only discourses about culture, but the actualities of the way we live in, in multiple ways. Uh, but it's unusual to see that kind of understanding bridge the economic, political, and, uh, and social realms. And, and that's the, the reason why seeing a project like Medellin, or the series of projects, is so um, so significant. 
And I have to um, give plaudits to Matilda McQuaid and uh, the exhibition, uh, which asks in a kind of provocative way, um, why design now? And I think projects like this actually point uh, or underscore, uh, thank you, why, uh, <laughs> why design is in fact um, uh, critical and why it, uh, it does matter. One also might question uh, the need for continuing to pose this issue. And, uh, and I think uh, it's probably because, in fact, uh, there's not the kind of uh, wide diffusion yet about uh, what architecture can do. About a year and a half ago, we brought students from Syracuse, New York, to walk through Medellin to meet with the former mayor, uh, Sergio Fajardo. And you might wonder, well, what is it? Uh, what is a group from a small upstate New York town and a small architecture program doing in Medellin? And uh, not only uh, were we there because, in fact, we we're trying to model uh, architecture, landscape architecture planning in a small, also economically strapped uh, area of New York State, but because we wanted the students to understand that there are multiple modes in the way in which architecture can participate, and that it doesn't happen um, by accident. And that there is generally uh, a, a kind of confluence of strategies, and there are unusual coalitions that happen that enable these kinds of projects to, to take place. So we're very lucky today to have uh, three people who are intimately involved in these projects and also to have them begin to unpack uh, the ways in which politics and economics and architecture intersect. And I think you'll hear through their presentations the ways in which these disciplines are interleaved, the way that, uh, in fact, uh, disciplines are not discrete, but the conversations happen across uh, broad areas of knowledge. Uh, so I'd like to start uh, this afternoon, this brief discussion, by asking each one of the panelists to give a kind of snapshot, of, a, a kind of initial view on, on uh, Medellin, how it happened, uh, why it happened, because we're always interested in um, backstory, and hopefully this is more significant than knowing about Britney Spears. So uh, this actually lets us know about the ways in which um, sort of culture is not something that's purely decorative. And I'd like to start with uh, Federico, uh, because uh, without the kind of um, will represented by public utilities, this couldn't have, have happened. I'd like to then go to Mauricio to talk about the ways in which implementation uh, occurs, the kind of techniques behind getting from an idea to a project. And then I'll ask Camillo, the architect of, of one of my favorite buildings in Medellin, the uh, Orchid Building, to talk about what it means as an architect to intersect with this process. So Federico, if you'd begin. Okay, my, uh, thanks. First of all, uh, <coughs> I apologize for my Spanish. <laughs> uh, let me try to explain all, all, all the things we have in mind uh, in, in English. Well, the first question is why or um, when this thing happens. And uh, the history came from uh, 1999 when a group of uh, citizens coming from the academy, the NGOs, the private sector that never had, uh, had been or were, were, were being involved in, in, in uh, public, uh, in, in public um, works um, decided to come into the, uh, politics just to see if, uh, how can we transform the city because we observe it every year that the situation, the gap between poor and rich were large and large. None of us were belongs before to, or uh, even now, 
to a formal political party in the country. So we decided to come there as a citizens, just to, as a contribution, we as a citizens uh, may provide to the city. And the first thing that we, um, once we went into, into the administration, is how to, to allocate the resources, the public resources, the investments, the social investment in every part of the city. By that time, and it's usual for uh, any political administration, is to assign the budget where the voters are. And it happened to be that in a city like Medellin, and like many other cities in Latin America, voters, the poor people, don't vote. Because they don't trust in the politicians. So the allocation of resources, most of that went to the places where the voters were. It happens to be the middle class and high class people. And the poor people, they didn't get what they need. So that was the first point. And the second point is um, we realized that in order to um, grow the standard of living of the people, it's, it's not only a matter of uh, having social scientists or engineers or economists. Uh, one of the key components of the quality of living is the quality of the structures, the infrastructure, the schools, the parks, the social buildings. So we realized that we have to be involved with architecture and with uh, urbanists too. And the, the father of Sergio Fajardo was an architect too. So he got, uh, he's a mathematician, but uh, he grew up uh, uh, surrounded by architects the whole life. So he already knew what, uh, what was, were the people to come uh, with in order to have that transformation. So we developed um, a, a team um, interdisciplinary disciplinary team to work in all these things. So uh, that is why we had all those uh, such a uh, good quality buildings in, in the poorest parts, as he said, the best buildings to the poor, the poorest population, in order to as a kind of inclusive. Uh, uh, um, uh, a policy uh, to let uh, them know that they are also account for the development of, of, uh, of the city and the de development of the, of the country. So that is uh, in a roughly way uh, what happened during all these years and for me it was uh, 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 I am proud to be a part of that team and uh, to be the coordinator of the development plan for the two administrations, the actual, the actual one and the last one. Uh, Mauricio, yeah. Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much, Matilda and Mark, to have us here. Uh, then I think, Mark, uh, that um, Medellin uh, is like a city, uh, as an exhibition city of the social transformation. In all our speak, you will know that um, our social transformation it gets nearby uh, with social urbanism. The social urbanism uh, means uh, maybe to reduce the gap between the richest people and the poor people. Uh, we have a very, very huge uh, gap between those, those uh, kind of population. So the um, social urbanism gets to the re reduce that gap 
between richest and poorest people. And I think, Mark, that the architecture uh, transformation of the city is maybe the trademark, the trademark uh, of the urban transformation. We can do that only with a conceptual and political uh, ideas. We needed uh, all those over there with a technical, a metal, and infrastructural way to do it. And of course, uh, in a scale, scale uh, of architecture. Maybe we have uh, three scales uh, of transformation. One, obviously the most important that Federico says, is the political and conceptual transformation. The second uh, way is maybe uh, the technical and the method of the planning transformation. And the third one is the building, the scale of the building, of the architectural uh, piece that made that uh, transformation. But also, uh, I want to ask for all the auditorium, uh, maybe a question. Which words to define or are used to define Medellin in the past? Maybe you can respond to of them. You have to say. Cartel. Uh, maybe cartel, <laughs> track, uh, uh, narco-traffic, uh, violence. That page, we also, uh, now we paste that page. Which word define now Medellin? That's in five years, we are um, having the, those or that transformation, not only in the physical ways, you know, in the social and the mental way. Now, we speak about transformation, modernization, coexistence, education, culture, and maybe, and happiness, of course. <laughs> and the word that's going to uh, define Medellin in the future is opportunities, inclusion, equality, to reduce that gap that we are working on. Uh, so that's in a very uh, general uh, way to describe that what are we doing in Medellin. It's actually a, it's a fantastic example of uh, redirecting the way people think about a place, both uh, from the inside and um, uh, from external audiences. No, how's how has your um, work as an architect intersected with this process? Uh, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, Matilda, for the kind invitation of being here today. Good afternoon to all of you. Um, for us, I, I have a very small practice studio in Medellin. And I think for us, it all began at the university like 20 years ago, when some young architects came to the, to the university to be our teachers. Among them were Mauricio and Alejandro Echeverri and uh, Felipe Uribe and many others. And then it was this atmosphere that was created there about um, redefining and the idea of public space. When we were at school, we were all the time doing these exercises about public transformation, public design. Uh, it was all focused on, on the city. How could we change the city we had? And, um, I should add to that uh, situation that we created a very nice group of architects of different generations and became, became friends. That's something that it's interesting. When you construct a friendship with your colleagues, then you can exchange and mix information and uh, share, share it. So in that process, when I could say when they all came to the power and, and got it as the mayor, as the secretaries, they chose a very nice and effective way to transform the city, which is competitions, public competitions. That's an instrument that without it, it's very rare to find good pieces of architecture, and it's very difficult to find opportunities for you as a young architect to build. So when we did Orchidorama, which is in association with my father and Plan B Architects, the office of a friend, a classmate, uh, we participate in a public competition. We were the youngest architects in the competition, and we got it. But it's through the competitions that it's this, I don't know how to call it. For me, it's like a device for creating opportunities and for creating discussions without 
competitions, the practice of architecture it doesn't get a new blood into the system, it doesn't get rehabilitated, it doesn't create discussions at all. And it's been two competitions that Medellin has transformed itself. Because I could say as well that what's, what all this development has caused in the city, first, it's a very strong sense of optimism. Uh, I remember when I was 15, 16, I couldn't get out at night. Uh, car bombs were exploding all around the city. You never, know if, you never knew if your father was going to come to have dinner. Maybe an explosion will cut him somewhere. And uh, all this situation has changed, and I think that people feel hope and optimism through architecture. People sense, you can sense and feel all the inhabitants with this willing to change, and I know there is a very strong, people is proud to be from Medellin again, and that's, that's a very strong sense. That helps you a lot to work when you have to design something because it creates a strong identity through the buildings and architecture. That's great. You know, it's an old line modernist notion that, that architecture actually transforms things, that it can actually uh, make a difference. It's good to be in this building um, also dedicated to education and, and in an institution that was dedicated to uh, making sure that the city's poorest had a good education in uh, engineering, uh, specifically, and um, Sort of new new technologies or new technologies as they were in the 1840s and it's continued to inhabit this role I was just out in Eugene Oregon which also has a building by Tom Main uh, and that's part of a, a design excellence program run by the GSA and and it's a it's also a kind of wonderful building and a great public space and it's um, unfortunately infrequent when we find uh, great public spaces uh, that reflect uh, what we know as architects and, and uh, designers. And I don't think that it's incidental that Sergio Fajardi's father was uh, an architect or that you are trained as an engineer and that, that uh, uh, actually the two flanking panelists are also uh, trained as architects. Uh, because it always seems there needs to be someone who is flipping the switch, who knows that design, in fact, as Camilo said, can be transformative. How, how did these, this decision or series of decisions get made that design would be the central core of the new identity for, um, for Medellin? And, and maybe you can, you can start this off. And, well, as I mentioned, uh, the first the concept for design of the, all, the, all these things come from a different view of the traditional uh, view that the politicians have. Uh, the traditional way is, is to build something that, that in, is just enough to fulfill the, the needs of the people without taking any care of uh, what is the quality of the building, what is the, the, the design of the building, uh, what is the artistic con conception of everything was equal, was the same blocks for, for schools designed by the same architect who just once for all the buildings. Uh, and poor construction for the poor. So, when we came there, we just uh, learned that uh, in order to be more inclusive, we have to put not only the best quality buildings there, but also the best quality design there through public competition with all architects, students or uh, professionals that were not only in, the, in Medellin, but, but in Colombia. Uh, an open public uh, competition for all architects in, in the country. So at the beginning we got some kind of, uh, they, they didn't believe that that's going to work. But uh, after the first or two competition, uh, um, 
people and artists and designers came into the into, into the picture and, 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 and were proud to, to, to put all of the, they had in, in, in their creativeness to, 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 to propose some in sometimes weird kind of uh, buildings like the ones that, that uh, we recently opened in the, for the South American games. Which is where, where, where for example, the, the coliseums for sports practices there. When you go there, you can't imagine that those are going to be, or those are coliseums. Or, or very weird structures, but, but very modern. Doctor. He's an engineer. Yeah. <laughs> but, no, no. What I want to say is that we all, all of we enjoy of that. I mean, it's, it's the, those, those are icons of the city, and it's not only one. Many of those, and I, I think that the, 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 the goal that uh, these guys have is how to put uh, another icon that they can be recognized, recognized in the city as, as, as a new icon. So this is a kind of a, a challenge for the designers. Every, every competition, every, for every building, to put all the, their best in having uh, the best for the city and the best for the citizens. So, and that, that happened, and that was the question, you have to change the way of thinking. And the way of thinking is, is quite different to the one to the one of the traditional way the politicians use to design or to produce or to act uh, in, 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 in the cities or in the country. So it's a kind of um, switching here in the mind uh, to, to, to do the things different in, uh, different in the way that it was traditional. So I, I think it was, it was the point. And, and the things that are working and, 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 and are producing results, like the ones that Matilda showed you on the, on the violent uh, indices, and working with the poor people. Yeah, I want to complement some things. Uh, one, uh, as Federico says, uh, the focalization of investments in uh, areas that is uh, characterized by low human development. That's very important. We not build a b very nice building in the most uh, decivilized areas. Or, or in the place where the voter huts are. Yeah, that's a very important thing. You ask us uh, how we did it. That's the first point. The second point is very important. It's like uh, social management. The social management uh, may be a child and um, inter-institutional coordination and also it uh, makes a uh, community participation. That's very important. All this building has a community participation. They'll think about it. They tell us uh, how they imagine the buildings, how they want to be in, into the buildings. So that's a, a very important thing of, uh, as a community participation. Um, I'm going to <laughs> Let me finish. Then it uh, has uh, or have a political um, um, intense that's Medellin the most educated as a political decision. Uh, then recover the confidence into public. That's very important. Uh, I think that uh, maybe uh, corruption is the main tax that paid by poor people. But I, 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 I want to compliment you in, in, in two things. One, uh, and, uh, I just pointed out that it's very important uh, Two things, the planning participation, I mean the, the public participation on planning and also the participation of public in budget. Uh, those two things are very inclusive and, and, and 
gets the attention of the citizens in their in, in, in how they can solve their own problems. One is the, the one point. And the other one is 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 not only having a building uh, alone in a portion of the city, is is a lot of things around that building, I mean not only a, a, a library park for, for example, but all this public space, uh, social buildings like uh, health uh, centers or the schools, uh, bridges, um, um, or, or building for, for helping the people to be uh, entrepreneurs, uh, many things. Uh, not only uh, not only the hardware, but also the software, uh, all together in the same region. That is one of the points of uh, why that thing is working. I want to finish, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We can spend uh, the same money, the same budget, the same uh, cost for a good building also for a bad building. That's uh, make a difference. Uh, when we uh, get um, high standard quality of the buildings, of the design, of the construction process, that's very important thing, uh, to increase the high standard quality of the process, including designers uh, like Camilo, like many other architects, uh, also the process of the construction. Uh, as you see in the in the presentation of uh, Matilda, there's uh, like a menu of libraries, of park libraries, school of qualities, uh, housing projects, transportation uh, projects, um, streets and uh, uh, public space. That's a menu that is very important uh, to put in the many territories in our city. But we have a method, uh, like uh, we put it a name, it's the PUIS, Proyectos Urbanos Integrales. It's like uh, urban integrate uh, projects, where we put all the same um, things in, in the territory. The library park, the school of quality, the street, uh, um, mechanism of transportation, that the cable, all integrates the Proyecto Urbano Integral. At days, at, at maybe same uh, method, they are learning from Rio de Janeiro, in Venezuela, in Mexico City, or other places, other countries. They are taking uh, this model as a, a method to transform it, uh, our city. Yes, um, I will compliment you both. No. <laughs> I a very agreeable group. Yeah, but, uh, no, I, 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 I would only like to add that um, the interventions that have been made in Medellin, it's, um, we're not star architects, we, we of course not. We, we have a very small budget compared to European or American budget. But I think that design in Medellin has become important because it's been made out of necessity. You know, how to deal with a, we could say like, a low-tech, high-concept approach to the projects. How, what can you do with a, with a certain budget, with a social consciousness, and with a deep impact in that place? And, of course, it, 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 it may sound funny, but it sounds like a MasterCard ad like a building, $200, usefulness, $500, and beside that, being beauty, priceless. So it's, it's all this concept that gets involved, but being very conscious of the impact of the buildings in these places, and um, how these buildings have been received by the inhabitants, it's amazing because we, we don't have a public culture as New York may have it, or Europe the public idea of being outside and that the things that are outside your house are public is rather new concept in Colombia and in Latin America, I will say. Or um, the idea of the public in Colombia doesn't have more than 20 years. 
uh, it began with uh, Bogota like 20 years ago and then we embraced that in Medellin and developed it a little bit farther and um, now you can see the people outside on the street uh, being sharing with the other inhabitants um, taking care of the buildings it also in Medellin also began with the metro we have a metro that is like 20 it's like 15 years old something like that 13 years. 13 yeah 13 14 years old and with the metro it also created a very strong urban culture you see that the floor the walls the everything it's absolutely clean it's people take care a lot of what they see as public so that helps a lot when you put one of these buildings or one of these public spaces in these neighborhoods because people immediately embrace it as a part of their own, a park of their, uh, like, uh, like another room of their houses. So there is a lot of, um, sense of yeah, sense of ownership, exactly. Yeah. Thank you for the compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to compliment you all and very, very well. I don't have to do very much, which is great. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting to hear this discussion about uh, public and private and also uh, sort of questioning the assumption that if architects are involved, it's going to cost a lot more money, uh, which is sort of a, one of the kind of dominant uh, tropes when you try to get uh, work built, that there's a kind of equivalence between what a building can accomplish and what it costs. But in fact, we do spend vast sums of money on architecture and infrastructure. It's really having the um, wherewithal and the knowledge to select the architects or the designers or to, or to understand the way in which a building fits into larger urban fabric. In the case of Medellin, who was making the selection of the architects? Who made a decision that Camila would get a building rather than someone else? Or that the building he proposed would be the most appropriate building for the, the park? Yeah, there were also architects. It was, it was a theme of, all, of judges, uh, most of them architects that uh, decided it uh, was an open, an open uh, uh, competition. So everyone that wanted to be there, they were free to, to present their work there. So the, the, the city, uh, the administration, uh, had a group of architects and the, in the planning office uh, and somewhere else. Somewhere else. Uh, that they were the judges, local architects, and they decided which, uh, what, what was the best work to, to Also build. foreign uh, architects. Uh, also, I would say, also foreign architects like uh, Charles Jimenez, uh, like uh, uh, teen architects, ¿cómo se llama? Uh, Enrique, North, uh, Enrique Norton, uh, uh, Enrique Soriano, there's a lot of uh, foreign architect judges is participating like uh, judges for all these uh, competition buildings. Uh, you know, often there's a, a, a resistance also to doing things in, in new ways. It's kind of natural thinking. We expect something different to happen, uh, but we, we don't really want to try new methods. The buildings, uh, the buildings and the infrastructure projects are quite different and stand in a kind of stark contrast to the existing vernacular What's the reception been from the community? And how do you talk about the buildings and their lack of familiarity with the context? Well, um, I, think it's been, I think it's been very interesting what has happened because, for instance, I, I, I can speak more precise about Orchidiorama. And it was very, it's been, people feel like, I remember it, yeah, I, I have to explain it this way. Uh, um, the day after the opening of the building, there was this lecture by Christian Samper, the director of the Smithsonian, about biology. And uh, it was very funny because it was the first time that the building was open to the, pub to the public. And so there were some interviews uh, to the people. And people were really, they felt a direct link with architecture because they, I think because when architecture is not as abstract as a modern architecture made of cubes, volumes, 
of this um, yeah, this, this long distance between what people can feel and what people can understand. In the case of Orchidiorama, they made it a link between, they said it's a honeycomb uh, panel, they said this is like a handmade basket, it's like a tree. <coughs> I, think that's, um, I think that's an issue that contemporary architecture has to deal with. And it's kind of an intermediate situation between abstraction and direct meaning of things. And in the case of uh, Biblioteca Santo Domingo, they also said that it, it's like a rock in the mountain. And um, Explora, they say that it's like some, yeah, they, they, they talk about these beautiful <coughs> red boxes. So when people can see something that they know in the buildings, they create a full link and an identity of, of resemblance with the, with the building. That helps a lot to create identity of uh, the community. It helps a lot to, so people can create a common knowledge of architecture. It links architecture and people, and with it, uh, a link with a public space. So they take care of the buildings. You, ca you can go to many of these buildings. They are almost four or five years old now, and they are still quite, very well um, conserved. I mean, you see the walls are clean, uh, materials are holding together, and people have a very, uh, a very deep feeling of that, they, that these buildings belong to them. That's very hard to create, but I think that's the success of also of these uh, interventions, that people feel that like they own these buildings. So sometimes they, when they walk around the buildings, they go to the director's office and says, and they say, sorry, and they say, this uh, thing is wrong, this is not well done. They became like a yeah, like manager of the, of the building, and that's very good. I want to say one thing, uh, Mark. We are uh, like a rebuild a city. The city already exists. This is not a new city. We have a lot of things existing. We already have a Orchidiorama uh, 10 years ago, a big roof but it doesn't make any reference to any people. It doesn't make a difference uh, that uh, Camilo already made. In each one of the buildings that we make, I think the, one of the most important things is that we make a reference in each territory. The building, uh, as I say, is a trademark for the people, for the territory, for the city, for the country. Uh, it's made a, a new reference. Maybe uh, 20 years ago, a reference of a child, it will be a man in a motorcycle with a gun. That's the reference they, got, they have. Now the reference is the Orchidorama that makes Camilo. The reference is the new school, the reference is the park library, the reference is the uh, street where they came, came and get together. That's important. Well, you know, um, uh, following the design of these neighborhoods, but also at the political level, to begin to kind of uh, broach these new ideas about the way the communities might be organized. That, that is where the social scientists came into the picture. Uh, so, um, how to convince them that the thing that they are going to be built for them is going to work for them? The beginning was very hard. I tell you that. But it, 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 it was, because uh, there was no any trust on the on the public uh, uh, administration. So. That was a part of the of the uh, it was a process of learning where the citizens and the administration and, and, and all people uh, build a, a kind of a virtuous uh, cycle in order to gain more trust on the on the public uh, administration and uh, and and and. And that was built up, uh, looking at the results. Uh, everything, all these things, they were not made at once. 
kind of stages according to the budget, of course. Um, but there are some indexes of uh, how that trust is, uh, is, is improving, is how the people pay the taxes, which is the, the main source of, uh, of, um, of uh, uh, I mean, the, the, where, where the money comes from to, to do all these things. Uh, well, the, 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 the most important thing is the, is the money come from taxes. 53% of the uh, budget of the municipality come from real estate taxes and uh, commercial and industry taxes. So before that, uh, they were not willing to pay it because they didn't, just didn't trust in that. And now, for example, the last, uh, last year figure, taxes increased in real terms 4%. Just in the middle of the crisis, the economical crisis and the financial crisis we had in the world, that city increased the revenues from taxes in 4% in real terms. So 53% of that money come from there. 55% come from the utility company, the one I run, EPM. EPM gives every year to the uh, owner, which is the municipality, 55% of the resources for the social investment yearly. And the other rest of the money comes from the national government, but that one is applied for maintaining the coverage of education and health, not for buildings and all those things. Well, so it's interesting to think about a public utility company that along with public funding through taxes actually helps to enrich the public realm. Um, it, most often we see the, the um, a kind of simulation of the public realm through malls and through strictly market-driven uh, kinds of uh, structures, uh, buildings. And uh, so it's, it's fascinating to see a kind of return to investment in the public realm, uh, what was the relationship between the kind of financial sector, between those who, in fact, uh, would want to build uh, malls and have those be the kind of de facto centers, uh, which we've seen happen in other, uh, certainly American cities, North American cities, and South American cities? Well, for, <clears throat> of course, all these things that are happening in the city, uh, things are um, paid more attention from private investors in real estate, in malls, in, 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 uh, in uh, commercial buildings. Um, so one of the points is, uh, well, they have to, um, there are some rules on the urban planning, uh, uh, urban planning um, uh, rules that they were developed uh, four years ago. Uh, now, for example, there is a, a, a kind of explosion of uh, uh, building new malls and commercial centers. Uh, and the relationship between those private investors in real estate and, and the administration is, well, as long as you hold the rules, the urban rules, you can do it. But the, the administration can cannot avoid to them to invest in that in in, 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 in any particular time of uh, of uh, <coughs> of the of the year. I mean, they they decided when, according to market uh, situation, to the market situation, back holding the rural and environmental type of rules. Uh, but there is a point that I think that's very important in, in, in this uh, thing in how the money comes from uh, for, to, to budget, you know, all, this, uh, uh, um, all these things. Uh, the municipality of Medellin owns EPN, which is the second largest corporation in the country. And that, that, that company, uh, uh, Pay services not only in the city, but in some, in more or less 40% of the of the Colombian uh, 
land. I mean, not only to Medellin, but also to some other cities in the country, in uh, electrical energy and gas and uh, water and sanitation and uh, also in telecommunication, broadband, the internet, or everything. So, but the most important thing is 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 owned totally by by the municipality, and in, it's not a matter of being private or public. It's a matter of how that company is managed, how efficient it is, and how uh, the company avoid the intervention of the politicians every four years when the administration changes. And that is happening to this company during the last 55 years, which is the, uh, the, the period of time where the company has been running. So, is the is as I mentioned before is the most of the more is is, is 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 one of the most important sources of uh, funding for for the city, and it's going to keep in that way for the la for the next uh, 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 years, as long as we are able to keep that company away from the intervention of uh, of the politicians, and, and this is a kind of a contradiction, but. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, 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 it's one of the things that, that you have to point out, uh, on how this city, as compared with other cities in, in Colombia and in Latin America, can solve much of their problems just being the owner of, of a company like this. It's, it's interesting to think about the kind of uh, lineage, uh, because Mauricio was the teacher for uh, Camilo, and so there's certainly some kind of tradition that has to do with architecture, that kind of uh, thinking about architecture in a, in a different way. And certainly with the support of EPM, there's a, a kind of the aspiration for continuity of new and, and more dramatic work. Camilo, as a, a, as a young teacher yourself, or as a young architect, I was floored that Camilo was actually the architect for this building. And he said, no, 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 I'm, I'm uh, 29. And so I'm quite old, but he's not 29. I won't tell his real age. I do all. <laughs> but um, how, how do you think um, seeing these projects actually getting built in the public realm affects your students? Well, I, I think there is something that is interesting in Medellin, and it's that we don't have any architecture masters. We didn't get not any... Yet. <laughs> no, we won't, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> No, I, I don't think we will, really. It's, um, it's quite open and freedom to do what you want as long as you have the arguments. Then it's an open place to, to do and to make. A, I can point out a big difference if somebody in Colombia will hear this, might will get in trouble. No, I'm, I'm joking, but for example, there is a big difference between Bogota and Medellin. Bogota had Salmona, Rogelio Salmona, you perhaps have heard about him. And um, it's, it's very heavy, the image of having an example of an architecture master in the city, because it creates a tradition, and a tradition that it's linked directly with the style. Imagine we don't have that situation, for good and for bad, because even though we don't have any masters, or a master a architect, um, we feel more free to do what we want or what we would like to investigate or to, or to create. And you can feel that at the university with the students. Students are open to do a new kinds of architecture without uh, compromising, a, without being irresponsible, I, I would say. A, for instance, for example, I believe that architecture such as parametric architecture it, it's almost impossible to be made in Medellin or in Colombia. Um, nobody will have these kind of budgets. The machines are unavailable, in a way. And all these trends that come and go forth and back in architecture, they come to the city quite filtered because of the distance. We, even though we're in the middle of the map, if you look at the world map, we're in the tropic, but we are disconnected for from all the cities, from all the mainstream things. So things happen in a very particular way. 
and that gives us a lot of freedom to innovate in a way, to solve problems mainly. Yeah. As in the same way as uh, the architectural, uh, um, maybe how Camilo expressed, uh, in the politician way we do it. Uh, we are showing you uh, like a movie, the end of the movie. Maybe we're going to have a Medellin 1, Medellin 2, 3, 4, and, yeah. But the process was very hard for us because we are, uh, as a politician, we are very ingenuous. Ingenuous. Huh? Naive. We are very naive. Yeah. But the only way that uh, we defend us uh, for the community and for the traditional uh, politicians, it was the technical issues. That was the only way that we, as an architect, as an engineer, uh, as a professor, like was uh, Sergio Fajardo, the only way that we defend for the politicians and for the community is the technical issues. That's a very important part of a very hard process. We are looking the last image, very nice image of the movie, but the process it was very hard. Well, um, being at the end of the movie is probably a good segue uh, <laughs> to opening uh, opening up the afternoon to questions, and I'm sure there must be an. Uh, is there a microphone? Uh, you, you're more than welcome to have one of ours so that uh, the questions will be uh, answered. Thanks. And um, uh, the microphone will be back. There's a question in the back row. Yeah, um, you with your. Uh, there's a okay. microphone just coming to you. Thank you. Um, this is to what group was the hardest to bring along on your plan? And what was the. I mean, it, it's a really hard process. And a lot of groups and a lot of politicking and bringing everybody around the community. And what was the one hardest challenge you faced? So what one group was the hardest to convince to come along? And what was the one challenge if you were, you know, in Rio and their mayor with the Olympics and the favelas? Yeah, you may want to answer this in another language, but here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, there are several groups. Uh, one, for example, the one we call the the juntas administradoras locales, local administrative uh, chiefs, boards that were they were elected, but they were elected uh, and they used uh, the traditional way the politicians communicate with them through contracts to giving some uh, advantage, particularly uh, advantage to them, in order to have everything done. So we changed all those things. We said, okay, we don't have with you, the only relationship we have, or we may have, in a positive way with you, is how you get involved in the project as a whole. But don't expect from us to have a contract. We are not going to give you any contract. Uh, so that rupture, that breakdown was, uh, at the beginning was very hard with those people there. But the things were changing when uh, the, the participating budget this uh, was uh, made in a kind of demo democratic way. They decided in what part of the city or the they neighborhood they, they, had, they had the needs. Um, there, were, there, there was a, a kind of a, um, uh, um, uh, um, a way to order in the, the, the things that we are, we are going to do in that neighbor according to the needs uh, 
uh, starting from the most uh, demanding need. So that was the first point. There are some other uh, particular um, persons that is very hard to deal with. The priests, for example. Yeah, it's very hard to, to deal with them because all uh, in the, in the same same situation they have some kind of privilege or they think they have privilege. Um, they, they, they are they, they think they, themselves that they are the representative the, 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 the of the of the of the community and not always in the same situation. I mean, uh, anyway. Uh, that was, I think, the, the, the most uh, hard uh, uh, situation with yeah. those particular groups to deal with in order to have these things done. Uh, but now, now the, the situation is, is quite different because there, there is a new conscience about that. Um, uh, and they have a uh, uh, very deep knowledge of what is their, their role, their, their natural role. I mean, we are not de uh, telling them that they are not going to be any more to be um, um, uh, bored of, uh, of, uh, of um, administrative uh, as they were elected, but the, the relationship has changed and they have understood that in order, um, and now it's, it's, it's more, much easier to have that. And the other group that is, uh, um, is very hard to deal with is the, is the, it's not the city council, but the councillor. I mean, the, uh, how do you say the council? How do you say council? Council. Council. No. They also um, act in the same way as the board of uh, uh, local administrative uh, boards uh, uh, members. So, and uh, but they are also have uh, have understood that. I mean, the, the things are changing in, the, in, the, in that way, and that I think this, that's the most uh, important thing. I want to compliment you one thing. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a, a very important reason, because in the election process, we don't uh, have any compromise with anything, with uh, nobody, with no natural uh, leaderships. We are independent. Mm -hmm. So all the things that we show you is because we think about it. We think it's important. That's not a compromise uh, between the administration and some of that uh, leaderships uh, in the territories. We are independent, absolutely. Um, and let me just, since we do have architects in the room, uh, Camila, I'd like to ask you, um, as an architect doing public work and doing highly visible public work, um, who were the who were the clients in your thinking and who were difficult? Well, for us it was, we are always thinking about the inhabitants of the city. We, we do have the studio in Medellin and we work from there, but of course our main client and what, that's why we participate in competitions and try to do public work, it's to bring people to architecture and to come together. We, we see art, at least in our studio, we see architecture as a device to exchange and to intermediate between people. To we, we see ourselves more as an agency rather than architecture studio conceived in a traditional way where, for example, our architecture enemy will be like the guy from the Fountainhead, something like that, you know? That's, it, it's not like that. We, we like to bring people together and how a building may connect people that before didn't know each other, or how architecture can uh, amplify a situation that before you thought it was maybe not important, but then when you see a building that resembles a tree or a forest, and then you can learn something about it, 
or where you can sit on a bench in the middle of a street where two years before you couldn't sit there or appreciate the landscape. For us, that's, um, that's very important. And we kept on thinking all the time, and we do it all the time, how to bring people together. I mean, it may sound very naive also, but it's, for us might be some things maybe you take for granted, but for us, where we come from and what we have experienced and the city we have, it, it has to be a leading light all the time. All the time you have to think about that because social differences are enormously big. Uh, it's um, Not everybody has a, an opportunity to go to the university or even to, yeah, or, or even to have a, a job. So when you, when you have this um, massive construction weapon as architecture or urbanism, then you have to shoot directly to the place where it creates the deepest impact in the best way and with the best possibilities. Uh, other questions? Uh, we have the mic, Aaron, here. There's a question in the front and the second row. Thank you. It's certainly remarkable what you've told us today and the transformation of Medellin from the time of the drug wars to, to what's happening in, in this decade. Uh, but I just wanted to ask if you could put it in perspective of what was Medellin prior to the drug war. Yeah. And I think that there, that was what, what you've been able to accomplish uh, has, has had roots that go way before the drug. Uh, wars in, in Medellin. Uh, Medellin was always different. Uh, there were entrepreneurs in Medellin uh, that were not in any other city in Colombia. Uh, let me give you one example. Uh, Medellin had three art biennials uh, where the best artists in the world came, over, came to Medellin. And out of that grew a whole school of of uh, artists from Medellin. Medellin has had excellent universities. Uh, so this has had a tradition of many, many years prior to the drug wars. And so my question is, how much did that tradition made it possible for what you have done without in any way implying that what you have done is less than in any way because of that tradition? But how much was it already a little bit of a fertile ground for what you did. Well, I think it's a count up for a lot of that. As you, as you said, Medellin is, uh, is, the, is the hometown of uh, uh, the most important uh, uh, corporation groups in, uh, in the country. And, and not only in the country, but they are also um, uh, uh, performing as a kind of multinational uh, companies that uh, with presence in several countries, not only in Latin America, but uh, in so many uh, other countries in the world. And that's, I think, count a little bit for that, because uh, as a difference from other cities, uh, uh, this is a, a, a generation of uh, of entrepreneurs, uh, very smart people, very well prepared people, including for the drugs, uh, unfortunately. Uh, uh, and that's a part of a kind of culture uh, of entrepreneurs that uh, live there and still live there. Uh, there's, there was a question that Mark made. Uh, in the lungs of where, where we born, where we're born, all of us born in Medellin, and uh, having a couple of years outside there studying, we went again to Medellin. We have most of the population there has a very strong sense of uh, ownership with the city, and that is why the group of people that is now running the city sometime in 1999 asked how to be involved in solve the problems. 
not to be politicians. But in order to solve that, you have to convert into politicians right? in a way. But how to solve the problems? Not being liberal or conservative or whatever, but the most important thing is, okay, this city has a very large amount of problems and you have to be involved in solving the problems without taking into account what the ideology to solve that. And that was most, the, the most important thing. And you have, as you said, many people from the private sector, from the academy, from the NGOs that are willing to participate in that transformation. And that I think is one, perhaps the most important uh, gas or oil for uh, feeding that up. I would like to add something, a, bit, a little bit of context, which is Medellin is located 1,600 meters above sea level in the middle of the Andes Mountains. We, we are very far from a river, we are far from a shore, we don't have a harbor, we don't have a port. So when Medellin came to the industrial era, we could say, at the beginning of the 20th century, um, we had to create our own resources in order to exist because we didn't have uh, any trade conditions such as, I don't know, Amsterdam or a city dates. It, it, it's not a port. And that, made, that makes us be very resourceful for all the good and the bad you can imagine. It's, Medellin is a cradle for all the good spirit of the human beings and the worst as drug dealing and all the things that got developed from drug dealing. So we have been through very difficult times as well. So I, I think it came to a point where everybody uh, really had to do something because otherwise we're going to keep on fighting ourselves. The Colombian conflict, it's a very stupid conflict in a way that it's not racial as South Africa. It's not about, it's not religious. So there are no, Arguments you can put on a on a on a discussion panel such as he's black and white, he's uh, Muslim and Christian. No, it's it's because all this social inequity that's been for such a long time that we live as we live, and all the things that Mauricio, Federico, at Fajardo's administration, at the actual administration of Salazar, and some of the private companies are doing now, it's trying to look for all this um, wasted time of many, many, many years of uh, being unconscious about the society we have. And all this mentality about being disconnected to the world actually helps a lot. Our biggest, uh, our biggest, uh, let's say, um, challenge, yes, is to build and create this equity and with what we have. So it's, I think it's an interesting case and of course we don't have everything solved out, but we are doing our best to, to do it from architecture, from the, from the public company, from the private companies. We are, we are trying and that's, I think that's, it's worth dying trying that not doing anything. For that you have to be very creative, I think. And, and, and maybe there's a phenomenon uh, called the, the second cities. There's much of uh, most important cities as the second city. Uh, Barcelona in uh, Spain, uh, Monterrey in Mexico, uh, maybe uh, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, there's a lot of examples of second cities. Second cities uh, want to be uh, not better than the capital, but maybe to increase and develop uh, many things about our own city. This question is from Federico. Uh, you say that EPM is provider different service in, in Colombia, and uh, from that revenue you are paying for that kind of libraries and parks and everything in, in Medellin. So my question is, 
for example, if you provide internet service in Cali, that revenue is going to pay for the buildings in Medellin, or you are planning that have like local plans for, for the city that you are getting the, the revenue? That's a, that's a very good question. But, uh, uh, the first one is, uh, I, I, I just want to question you or to, to ask you, why don't you ask the same question to the private providers? What they do, they do with their net income, income with the revenue they, they can get from uh, from I, I have the I I have this the following answer for example the electrical energy you provide for every city in the country comes probably from uh, let's say three companies the generation company let's call it Isahen which is the th state-owned company. You have, you have a kil kilowatt power from there. The transmission of that energy is provided by ESA, which is another state-owned company with some private uh, uh, shareholders there. And the distribution is provided, let's say, by EPM, in Cali, maybe uh, in Cali or in some other cities, uh, some other distribution companies. Uh, somebody asked me once, uh, why, if I buy the, the energy, electrical energy to you, to EPM, we as a municipality of, uh, of uh, let's say, Pereira, why the revenues of the net income is going to Medellin. Okay, first, first of all, uh, why don't ask the same question to ISA and ISA Hen, that part of the energy is provided by them. The second thing is I, I told, I like, I, I asked them uh, about that, I, okay, I don't have shares of uh, ISA and ISA Hen. Well, you don't have shares of uh, ETN. Or Ecopetrol is providing the, the gas for the cars in every part in the country. And it's giving very huge revenues or uh, net profits to their shareholders, inclu including the government. And nobody is asking why Ecopetrol is not distributing the net income to the cities where they provide the, their, their gas. So the situation here is that Medellin has done the work with the um, with the with this company during 55 years in a very responsible way. Most of the towns in the country had before public utility companies. Cali had one, Colin Cali, Bogota had the one their own, Barranquilla had and all the cities had uh, utility companies owned by the municipalities. And the only one in the country nowadays that has the situation it had is EPM. All others are owned by private companies or by private investors. They have in all net profits to their pockets not to the, the cities where they pay the services. And the only one that had lasted for 55 years and growing and growing in a responsibility, in, in a respons responsible way has been EPM. So what we have for, for that, for, for such, such a cases is to develop a kind of a corporate social responsibility. <coughs> so, it deals not only with shares the net profit with them, but also to be involved in social programs, in social programs in the city, cities or towns where we pay, we pay the services. That's the way how we are handling that situation because your question is very used, I mean, it's, 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 it's very common in all the places where we pay the services. Uh, 
Hi. Uh, Matilda read a quote earlier from Mayor Fajardo uh, saying something like, uh, we must plan to prevent improvisation. And I was wondering if that was in contradiction to this spirit of resourcefulness and spontaneity uh, this, that Medellin has a history of, or am I interpreting that uh, in a different way? Does that apply to something more like the targeting projects to make a, de uh, a deeper impact? Well, why don't we ask uh, Mauricio, since you've been working on public works. <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, in the past we were having uh, many examples of how to build a city, how to plan a city. Um, and I think in, in these two administrations, Fajardo's and uh, Salazar administration, we already <clears throat> uh, introduced some methods to work on. That's not a well, it's not the perfect method. I think that's the starting point to differentiate it between maybe other methods, maybe other ways to work with the community, with the people, with the citizens. And this is a starting point to have a, maybe as a politician that we are not a genius. Naive. 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 <laughs> uh, now, <laughs> yeah. uh, but we have a, a lot of work uh, on the future. We have a lot of uh, responsibility for the future, for many problems that we have. Uh, narco traffic is a problem in our city. Violence is a problem for our, our city. But I think that uh, all the things that we are planning to the future as uh, it's maybe the starting point. Yeah, but I think that this point is very, very important. Is uh, the problems, the amount of problems, are much, much larger than the uh, uh, availability of resources to, to solve it. So you have to prioritize the the budget in order to uh, be more precise in what is the most important project to solve now, now, and for that you need planning. For that you need planning. And uh, there is uh, also one thing which is, we, we were not used to long-term planning. Our society is not a planning society. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit exaggerated, but when you, when you live in a tropical belt, you don't need to plan for the winter. You don't need to plan for spring. You need to plan because almost every day is the same. You find food just around the corner in a way. But in the urban culture of Medellin, there was this idea of planning had disappeared absolutely. And every society needs a project in a, in a broad sense, in a wide sense, which is what do we want to be, how do we want to be, and how we're going to do it. And being resourceful is useful as a tool to deal and develop this plan. But you need a plan, and you need a point, a goal, how to get there, in how many years, with what budget, with which instruments, with which architects in this case, with which um, offices. So in these two last administrations, a plan is being created, and it's working. And it's becoming like a um, policy of state, in a way, that you have to give a, a continuity to it. So all these things can have a deep impact. For sure, there will be some generations that will be lost generations. So many people between 18 and 25, 30 years, they didn't have the same opportunities that the, that the kids that are now 12, 8, 14, or that are being born now because now they have a place to go to study. They have a system of education with very good quality schools. They have a, a board of uh, CEOs, we can say, giving advice of how to create new companies, how to create all these mini enterprises. 
to medium. So there is, there is a project now, in a way. How can we develop ourselves as a society that before we didn't have it? So that creates a very big difference, and that's why planning has become important. Also, uh, the last uh, master plan of our city was in 1949. It's almost 60 years ago. There's the only one that uh, makes a binary set in the 49s. Now we are looking forward for a new master plan. We are making uh, the new studies or uh, have a, a future a region a master plan. Uh, I think we have. I think we have time for one more question. Um, whose who's hand is? Uh, Thank you. Um, I vaguely thought I heard the gentleman in the middle mention the South American games. Did I hear you correctly? Right. Um, and that really points to the last two statements. Um, you you obviously hosted South American games. Did you? Yes. And then the second gentleman, the left gentleman on the left, mentioned the, the rationale of second cities and pointing to Barcelona. Uh, yeah. And then the third gentleman on the right came to plan. <laughs> and so my question is posed right there. How did the South American games uh, enter into your process? Was it there before you had this research and so forth? Did you have this research and so forth first and then chose to go after the South American games? And how did South American games help you in your evolution of thought and in actual fact planning and what was the legacy. Well, I, I think that um, when Medellin uh, only thing that we think about it, it was many years ago about drugs and uh, narco traffic and violence. Uh, in the last three years, we are thinking in Medellin in many other orders like the uh, bead assembly, IDB, IDB um, the OEA assembly too, the Suramericanos, uh, Juegos Suramericanos, Suramerican Games. Uh, it makes that we put Medellin in other way to look it, in other different way. And uh, for the South American uh, Games, that's a very uh, nice and good um, opportunity to increase uh, all the equipment, all the buildings about uh, sports. So we can have the new coliseums that uh, Federico um, speak about it. Uh, in we say that it's uh, the little or the second Beijing, but we love it in that way because all the people, all the citizens lead the uh, Sur Americanos games as the most important thing uh, happened in the city in that time. Next, uh, uh, in uh, October, we're gonna have the uh, Ibero-American Biennial of Architecture. And almost over there, we're gonna have all the city uh, leaving uh, this event. So, uh, even uh, we have a South American Games or uh, Assembly or a BNL, we are introducing all the citizens to this kind of events. Yeah, we have to build up a, a, a new city brand. The brand that we used to have was the drug smuggling and drug war and violence brand. So, we take advantage of any of those uh, 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 e events, like the South American Games, like the IDB assembled, like the one uh, of the uh, Biennial of uh, Architecture, uh, Ibero America, Biennale Ibero Americana of Architecture. Every event for us is a city event. All the citizens of the city has to deal with. And that is the most important thing. It's not only to have, to have um, uh, um, uh, sports or uh, sportists uh, from uh, all the uh, South American countries there. It's a matter of what is going to happen with those scenarios after that. 
with the people that is going to use that in the same manner as the uh, uh, library parks. Those are very high quality scenarios for practicing the sports. And to have uh, uh, the, the best pools in the country, the best coliseums and basketball uh, uh, arenas, uh, everything, just to practice for everybody there. So the South American Games was an excuse for that. But for us, the, the, the challenge is to lead to the citizens of the, of the city the best scenarios in the cultural, in sports, and everything for the uh, use of the citizens. And in doing that, to have a new brand of the city, new image of the city. And that is why, or what we are trying to build. Um, we think in the near future we are going to get that goal. And uh, there is all these events, they also try to create like Medellin as an open university in a way or that people can learn from it. For example, when it was the IDB assembly, um, there was for, for instance this lecture by Bill Clinton and then it was televised for the whole city in the local channel. And every time there is this kind of events, they are televised, there are some events that are for free so people can come in, listen. It's not only for expertise that go there. So in a way, people can get connected to what's going on around, how to learn from an economical forum, how to learn from architecture, urbanism. And in this sense, all these events also, they are, as Federico just said, excuses to create different public spaces as well. With the South American Games, there was this street that is called the 17th Street that for these games, it was transformed as an open-air shopping center. According to your question earlier, how to fight the mall phenomena or all these kind of uh, peripheries, uh, displacement or going to the peri periphery. So in this case, there was this street with uh, some consultants and working with the community. They, are trans they transformed already this city into like a boulevard with very wide sidewalks, uh, beautiful public illumination, uh, lighting, sorry, lightning, um, very nice benches, and giving kind of a social cohesive, uh, got together, I don't know the word, yeah, yeah, yeah cohesive. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, so they can see that the street is also a place to be. You know, sometimes the arguments, as Mauricio said also before, had to be technical, because many people said that they rather go to a mall because they don't have to walk or leave the car somewhere. But when you count all the steps from where you leave the car to the, to the shop you want to go, you walk almost the same, but it's better if you do it on the street. So all these kind of things try to create this urban culture that we told you before that we didn't have. Well, thank you. I can see because Matilda is on the stage <laughs> that soon she'll be upon us so that our, uh, our afternoon is uh, coming to a close. It's been a very, very good discussion. I've enjoyed hearing you. I'd, like um, I'd like to recognize Matilda McQuaid again and the group of Hewitt for having assembled this and feeling so passionately about the quality of what architecture can do. So it's really critical. Thank you.